All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to the public hearing for the marijuana metric batch tagging. My name is Nicole Blasse and I am the rules coordinator for the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission. Today is December 19th, 2022 at approximately 10 a.m. and this public hearing is being held virtually. The purpose of a public hearing is to give interested parties a reasonable opportunity to submit data and or personal comments prior to the adoption of permanent rulemaking. This morning's hearing is being held in accordance with Chapter 183 of the Oregon Revised Statutes, otherwise known as the Administrative Procedures Act, Division 1 of Chapter 845 of the Commission's Administrative Rules, and Division 1 of Chapter 137 of the Oregon Administrative Rules, otherwise known as the Model Rules of Administrative Procedure. Please be advised that today's hearing is being recorded. During this morning's hearing, I will accept comments from anyone who wishes to submit them. If you are interested in providing testimony but have not yet signed up, please email us at olcc.rulemaking at oregon.gov. If you wish to submit written comments after today's hearing, you may do so provided that all submissions are received by 5 p.m. on December 31st, 2022. You may submit written comments by emailing olcc.rulemaking at oregon.gov. In accordance with OAR 137-001-0040, all public comments received on this matter, whether in the form of written document or oral testimony, will become a part of the permanent rulemaking record. Here's the summary of the proposed rule. Currently, OLCC producers and medical growers reporting in metric are required to use single-use RFID tags on all individual plants 36 inches or higher. OLCC staff have heard concerns regarding the, the cost of these tags, both in terms of the material cost as well as the labor cost of affixing and managing individual tags. OLCC staff propose amendments to plant tagging requirements that would reduce the number of RFID tags required in order to balance accountability for reporting and compliance with lower cost for producer licensees and medical growers required to report in metric. At this time, we do not have anyone signed up to give testimony. If you are interested in speaking, uh, you can raise your hand on Teams or speak up or email us at olcc.rulemaking at oregon.gov. Uh, it does look like uh, Myron Chadowitz would like to provide testimony. Myron, if you could, uh, before you begin, please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. Um, my name is Myron Chadowitz. Um, I'm the president of a farm in um, Lane County. Essential Farms is the name of the farm. Um, we're a tier two cultivator. We've had our license uh, since the onset of uh, recreational. Um, I'm going to speak as a craft grower from a very unique situation. I do believe that the cost of the tags and the environmental waste of the tags is excessive. However, I believe that switching over to a batch plant plan has many pitfalls that people are not thinking about, especially people who are craft growers. And I think this needs to be paid attention by the OLCC. There are certain things within cultivation that a batch planting situation would make things difficult for. And my request is that if the OLCC is considering switching to a batch plant um, a mode of doing tracking, that they put into, uh, into the plan a way for us to be doing changing of strains. Very often we'll find that, yes, we're a small farm and plants get mixed up and you'll end up with a batch, and I'm using batch loosely right now, where let's say I plant in beds and in my 11 plants, someone will mix up a clone and I'll find one plant that's of a different strain. Currently I can go into the metric system tag that plant and switch its strain and just continue on as uh, we go through, harvest it into a batch with the strains that it matches. If we switch to a batch planting situation, that entire bed would be tagged as one batch. 
when that plant was found to be a different strain, how would that be able to be brought up to be a different strain? How would you kill that plant off and then raise one into its life if you figure it out at, let's say, four weeks into flower? And these are the type of challenges that I think people really need to think about when they make a decision to switch over from an individual plant status over to a batch plant status. Um, I'm going to end with just one slight suggestion that I think could handle all the, some of the concerns that people have. If we are considering, if the OLCC is considering moving away from individual plant tagging and is moving towards batch planting, what about if you kept the requirement that there's a tag for every plant, but they do not need to use the blue plastic plant tags that are now currently shipped with every single tag? We don't have the ability to request just the tags themselves and not the plastic blue stands that the OLC sends us. If we were required to just have a tag for every plant and then use whichever attaching system that we wanted to use, including just hanging, say, 10 tags with the 10 plants in a pole or something, then at least in metric, each plant would still have its own individual ID. We wouldn't have to individually tag every single plant. We could be keeping those tags together and we wouldn't have the environmental waste of the plastic um, attaching pieces. Um, that is, that's all I'm asking. I'm asking for us to just keep in mind the small growers as well that do do craft growing and do have to make changes during the plant's life cycle. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Myron. Uh, next, we have Mike Getlin. Mike, if you could please state your name and affiliation for the record. Mike Getlin. Okay, uh, next on the list, I have, uh, there's no name associated with the handle S3LLC. Okay, I have. Hi, he hello. Yes. Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Jason Lampman. Um, I'm with State 3 Farms. Uh, I just wanted to um, just give comment. Um, I guess I would, uh, there was someone who just spoke. Uh, I, I guess I can understand their um, their concerns too. That actually, that, that did make a lot of sense. Sometimes there is time, there is need to change that. Um, but I also wanted to just give comment today and just say that um, oftentimes I get these emails and it, it's, um, and, and there isn't any care given to uh, environmental concerns. And I just wanted to say thank you to the OLCC for just even thinking about um, environmental concerns. And uh, this was just a, it was, it was a welcome change of, of, of a, I, I'm just impressed that there, it, it is a, the thought that went into making a positive change for our industry. So I just wanted to give comment on that and say thank you to the OLCC. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, Mike Getlin, are you there? Okay, uh, we will wait another five or 10 minutes or so. Um, if everyone could please remain on mute, I will try to get Mike um, available to provide his testimony. Um, otherwise, you can um, send a note in the chat or email us at olcc.rulemaking.oregon.gov. Uh, we'll remain open and running and recording for another 10 minutes or so. Thanks. All right, it looks like we have a request from Anthony Taylor. Anthony, before you begin, if you could please state your name and affiliation. Uh, thank you. My name is Anthony Taylor. I'm the chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission. I'm also an OMMP patient and grower uh, for myself, but I raise this issue. I'm wondering if there's any room for a waiver on tags entirely for OMMP growers. A lot of these growers are growing for three or four patients, so they've got 12 to... I'm sorry, um, 18 to 
48 plants growing. And when we order tags for those, we don't order very many, but the cost of those shipping those tags usually far exceeds the amount we pay for the tags. So we need some exemption in there for our OMMP growers that are required um, to report into the metric system. These are OMMP growers with three or more patients. And we um, are, I'm advocating that we reduce the cost of these growers as they're pretty substantial now anyway. So if we can figure out a way to put an exemption in there for OMMP growers, that would be great. The other thing I have is I'm concerned and confused a little bit by on page six of the definitions for usable hemp and um, hemp items. The definition of usable hemp uh, mean, um, I'm sorry, cannabinoid product. It means a hemp edible or any other industrial hemp commodity or product intended for human consumption or use. And though that worries me, um, there's a lot of uses for cannabis other than what's going on in the regulated system. I know that further down, it talks about what hemp is and what it means and what it isn't. Uh, and there's a second concern in there for uh, myself as well, because we're talking about seeds that are incapable of germination by itself. That means the seeds have to undergo an irradiation process to make them incapable of um, <clears throat> germinating. And so uh, that is a, usually an irradiation process and it um, depletes the amount of nutrients in a germinatable seed. And I'm just hoping that we can get rid of the part about incapable of germination because that affects a lot of products out there that um, use hemp hearts and hemp seeds um, for other products that um, it will, um, making them <clears throat> enable of, incapable of germination makes them uh, lower in nutritional value. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anthony. All right, we're going to uh, stay open and recording for another five to 10 minutes unless we receive any more requests to submit testimony. Uh, Mike Getlin, are you there? I think so. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Mike, <laughs> thank you. Um, before you begin, if you could please state your name and affiliation for the record. I'm very sorry, and thanks for your patience, guys. Um, Mike Getlin here, uh, now with Nectar Markets. Uh, I also founded Old Apple Farm as a, a Tier 2 producer in Clackamas County back in 2016, and I'm the current board chair of the Cannabis Industry Alliance of Oregon. Um, really quick, my, my main thing is a big thank you here. I know that this has been awkward given the constraints of working with Metric. Um, I know a lot of you guys, TJ, you individually put a lot of work in on this over the years. And as you guys know, this has been near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, just for a little bit of reference, we're, and, and one of the reasons it's just so important to me, um, you know, we've, our farm's been in tremendous financial distress for years now. Um, we've gone from 38 employees down to two going into the 2023 season and are going to a wind down model focused on extract products. So decreasing the cost of plant tagging to us going into next year is literally making the numbers work um, on a deal that we've been able to do to save our business and uh, and keep on fighting to keep as much of this industry in Oregon as we can. So I'm really grateful. Um, Myra and I also understand some of your comments. Um, you know, I have a very different perspective uh, having run you know huge plant counts, you know, 30, 40,000 plants a year for several years now. Um, and that cost is, has been staggering. But again, this is a great example, I think, of um, you know the agency working with us to, to move the needle on something that really matters to a lot of people in this industry. And I'm just very grateful for your support on it. So thanks, guys. And let's, uh, I know this isn't over the finish line yet, and we got to get in there and get some funding for it. But uh, we're there with you, and we appreciate all your help. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we will keep the recording open for another five minutes or so to see if there's anybody else who would like to provide testimony today. Yes, Myron, if you could state your name and affiliation again for the record. 
Hi, yes, it's just Myron uh, Chadowitz from Essential Farms again. Hey, Mike. Um, I, my, my, my final statement is um, that the OLCC, I want to thank you guys as well and for really looking at everything. I just want people to keep in mind um, that farms that are 30 to 40 or 50,000 plants compared to farms that have a couple hundred is something we need to look at as, as, a, um, as the Oregon recreational um, economy here and, and who's surviving and who's not surviving. I mean, we're all hurting, but um, I don't know if we should be passing rules that give advantages to large scale operations and make it harder for small craft companies, which is I think what the heart of Oregon is about. So Mike, I know that, that I'm not targeting you in any way, but when you start talking about 40 to 50,000 plants or thousands and thousands of plants, yes, I'm sure the labor is very intensive on those, but that's the scale that, that people are working on. Um, and as long as we design a law that works for big guys and the little guys, I'm happy as can be. And, uh, but that's it. And uh, thank you again to the OLCC for really taking into account what farms really need to survive. Thank you, Myron. Wait another couple of minutes, folks. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can anyone hear me? I sent an email, but I'm not sure it went through. Uh, I did not receive it, but we can hear you. And if you could kindly state your name and affiliation uh, before you provide testimony. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, my name is Sarah Neistraff, and I am with Green Bandit. We are a tier two outdoor um, sustainable regenerative farm in Southern Oregon. And um, I also want to express my gratitude for um, the efforts here to reduce that plastic waste. Um, I did have the same concerns as the first speaker that we definitely want to make sure that it is possible to change um, plant strain um, during the vegetative and flowering phase in case we catch any uh, mislabeled plants. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how we might go about doing that in a way that is feasible and also in compliance with tracking. Uh, one thought that comes to mind is that within that plant batch of 100 plants, that any of those batches could just be edited, right? So, you know, I find maybe just one plant in of those 100 that is a different strain, if I can just go in, edit that batch, reduce it by one plant, and then, you know, maybe I have to create another batch or I can add that plant to an existing batch of the correct strain um, that still has space within that 100 plant limit. Um, just something that does make it easy for us to make those corrections and not be stuck uh, with, you know, the strain names within those uh, marijuana plant batches once they are created. Um, otherwise, I, you know, I think this is a great step in the right direction. Um, ultimately, eliminating that plastic altogether would be ideal. Um, I think we might have lost our speaker. <laughs> uh, feel free. Is there anybody else on the hearing today that would like to provide testimony today? Okay. Uh, at this time, there have been no further requests to submit comment, so we are going to conclude the hearing. Please remember that written comments must be received by December 31st at 5 p.m. to be considered during rulemaking. Thank you for your interest and participation and have a great rest of your day.